Hey guys, and um, yeah, happy Friday night to so many of you in the UK. And there's a question that keeps popping up, right? Something that keeps being asked of me is, you know, which business should I join? Which business should I be part of? What is it I should be doing? What are the telltale signs? What is the good thing to do? What is the right thing to do? And then outside of that, I'm getting people say, Phil, will you take a look at this? And I'm being pitched ideas, ten a penny, from a variety of different sources that people think are the next best thing or that most important slice, or the thing that is better than anything else. And I've been around a little while in the world of business. So I'd like to think that, although this is just my opinion, that my opinion counts for something. Because since the age of 14, I've been building businesses, and I've seen everything from large corporations to successful network marketing businesses to traditional one-man bands to mum and pop shops to everything else in between. And I know what it takes to be able to make something count. But my humble opinion right now is that one of the things that really every household should be considering in some way, shape or form is that having one source of income is definitely not the best idea. But being in a situation where what we're looking to do is to be able to feather our nest and look at being able to make money outside of traditional patterns is more important than it's ever been at any point in society. And what I love about network marketing in particular is it talks to a number of different situations. See the reality of it is, is the days of going to get a good job, a good job that looks after you for life and then pays you a handsome retirement, those are historic events of our past. Setting up a traditional business in today's marketplace is a challenge because raising finance is tough, the risks attached to it can be remarkably difficult. And then there's the franchising industry, which is remarkable in terms of the opportunities of being able to create a ready-made business. But most people aren't in the situation of being able to make that initial investment. So we've still got to look at it and say, okay, Phil, I get it, right? We live our busy lives, that trying to fit something in and around those busy lives and being able to juggle all the things that we need to do. Having a home-based business could be a great thing to be able to go and do. But what's the business that I choose? Because it seems to be that there are opportunities everywhere, right? When you go looking for them, they are absolutely everywhere. So, so I figured something that might be helpful to you all is if I shared with you the nine key things that I look for when looking at a business opportunity. Because most of my weeks are spent either listening to pitches, making pitches, or making decisions, right? So I've heard it all, I know what I'm looking for when it comes to a great business opportunity. What is it that makes a great business opportunity? Well, the first, number one thing that I look at for any business is, um, is the product. <coughs> what is the end result thing that we are looking for an individual to be able to part with money for? What are we physically asking the end user of our business system to be able to part with cash for? And when I'm looking at that product, that final outcome, if it doesn't please the customer, then I don't want to touch it. There needs to be an abundance, a big deep pocket of people who already have an interest in wanting to buy that thing. There needs to be a problem that is being fixed as a result of the insertion of this product. And what I love to see is existing happy users of that product. That's an important thing. A ready-made customer base. Not only do I want a ready-made customer base, I'd like the product to have some consumability to it. Not something people that buy once and love, Something that people buy once and love and then come back and want to buy more and come back and want to buy more and come back and want to buy more. Because there's a big difference in a business, right, that you have to find brand new customers for each and every month versus a business that you can find the customers for, look after and then take care of them moving forward on from there. So product wise, do customers love it? Is it consumable? Do people want to be coming back for more? There's the first thing that I tend to look at. Second thing that I tend to look at when looking at a business opportunity is what's the risk? What is the genuine risk or exposure to me as a human being if I'm going to invest in this business, if I'm going to invest time, money, energy, etc.? What is the human risk to me? And risk is dressed up in a number of different forms. Firstly, look at financial outlay, capital that is played into that business. How much of your own money are you putting at stake? And what is the genuine risk? See, traditional business, you might have to outlay for a significant amount of stock up front to find yourself then hopeful of the fact that you could sell that on as a margin, but how much do you sell? Are you left in a situation where well, you might be holding stock? You might have to incorporate some markdown on that stock in order to be able to take it. You might have to pay to store that stock whilst you're waiting for it to be able to sell. 
you then might have to inject cash flow out before you get the money back in. So can you weather the storm that way? What rate of sale do you require in order to be able to manage that cash flow? Not only that, when you think of risk, you've got to consider risk in another way. What about risk towards reputation? Now in many a business, particularly in the network marketing industry, when we're considering what might need to happen here, is you're going to find your success through introducing other people into the business. So how much risk is attached to what you believe is a good idea, if you're going to tell other people that it's a good idea, that if it then doesn't work out, what do you do to your reputation if that business is to fold, if the thing you're asking them to pay into isn't real, or if the business in some way in the future doesn't fulfill its promises, that reflects back on you. So we've got financial risk, but we've got reputational risk in there too. And then the other risk that you have is, is time. You know, how much time is it going to take for you to be able to get there? And knowing the amount of time it's going to take is a really important thing to be able to consider. Because if you can't get to the big money, because you're going to run out of time before you get there, what's the point on going on the journey? So does it feed you in a day-to-day -day basis whilst you're chasing the long-term dream? So that's the second thing that I tend to look at. Third thing is the bit where it starts to get a little bit exciting, is scalability. I get many people pitch me great ideas. Phil, I've got this you know, fantastic little idea. And we see it like Dragon's Den style, right? People pitching ideas that they can sell into their local communities but they cap out really kind of quickly. So I had a conversation yesterday here in Los Angeles with a traditional business that is providing a service to help people in the physical health and wellbeing space by assisting them with stretching exercises. They set their pricing out, showed me what they're all about, and in fact, they provide a beautiful little service. They have six beds that are available for you to be able to take care of, and their opening hours are from 10 a.m. till 8 p.m. at night. So they have a capacity, it's a fixed ceiling. They can't go past that ceiling in terms of scalability. So there'd be no point me investing into a business of that nature because I know what the best of the best of the best looks like. By scalability, I mean how big can you go with something? This is particularly apparent when you're looking at network marketing businesses because you wanna be able to say, can I take this with me anywhere and everywhere? Is this something that I can be able to work with in a global marketplace? Because if there's one thing that the world of the internet has taught me more than anything, it's that the world is far smaller than most people gave it credit for. The ability to be able to communicate internationally means that being able to do business internationally opens up opportunity. Now I'm British, I'm proud to be British, but the British economy is not anywhere as strong as it has been in, decent, in previous years. So the ability to better pick up and work in other alternative marketplaces is something that gives me great confidence. If I'm looking at a business opportunity, is it universally acceptable or applicable outside of that? Can I scale it? How big is the sky? What's the cap? What's the ceiling towards my income? Is it a saturated marketplace or is there more opportunity within it? So that's just three things I look at. I said there's nine things that I'd look at. What else would I look at? I'd look at competition. And when I say competition, my main thing that I want to look at in competition is can somebody else come and steal my idea? So how much control is there in and around the product, the service, the solution experience? What is the barrier to entry if somebody else was to steal this idea and run with it and throw more money at it? Because you can have the best idea on the planet. If you can't get it to market quick enough and somebody with more money can do it quicker than you are, your best idea will just get copied. That is what happens. So do you have unique patents against your products? Is this something that within this business system is non-competable against? Can you put yourself into a marketplace of one with your product offering so other people cannot truly compete? See, I'd like to think that with the training programs, etc., that I put together, the unique style and strategy towards the way that we tend to do things mean that my true competition is zero. There might be people that can run things on paper that look similar, but in reality, they don't control the process in the same way. So I'd like to think that being in a marketplace of one is really goddamn important. But what else is important when it comes to competition is what is the supply chain of getting that product to market? So if you're going to make promises to your consumers, who's in control of the creation of the thing that you're making promises on? So me personally in my training business, I'm in complete control of the quality of all the information because it's mine, it comes out of my head, I make it up and then I therefore produce it, create it, control it and every person that I work with in my organisation is directly under contract by me, control the whole thing, that gives me confidence. 
When you look at many network marketing businesses, they're split in two ways. Some control the supply chain right the way from farm to table with product wise. All the way through, every chain in command in the production of said product is something that's in complete control of the company that is responsible for paying you your income. If that be true, you can have confidence that this thing is always going to be available to you, it's always going to drive the market. If that thing is not true, what you're actually doing is working with a middleman. If you're working with a middleman and somebody else puts the prices up, there is a change in requirements. Somebody else buys that order of that wholesale good in place of the company that you're partnered with. The product that you've relied upon for such a significant period of time could be taken from you overnight, could disappear in an instance. And that makes me kind of nervous. What about the other thing to think about, though, is your exit strategy. Lots of people look at a business and they say, well, how easy is it to get involved? We talked about risk a little while earlier on. But what most people do not think about when they're going into a business for the first time is how am I going to get out of this? Chances are the business you start is going to be a business that you're going to want to get out of in some way in the future. Whether that's something you're going to sell on to somebody else, whether that's something you want to retire and continually generate a revenue from whether it's something that you would be able to then tone back your regular activity, work it in a different capacity to how you're working it right now, and it delivers you a long-term revenue. See, a business is an investment. It isn't a job. A job you can quit, and there are no consequences. A business always has consequences, and when you start something, that something is going to exist forever until you change it. So when looking at businesses, what happens when you want to retire? What happens if you want to sell it? Is it truly willable? Can you pass it on to your children? Are you in a situation where what you might be able to do with said business is be able to carve it up in some way? Is there a way that what you can do is that you could minimize your own personal activity into it so that you can explore some other options? What are the controls that are therefore attached to that? These are all considerations that I would like to have too few more things that I would consider is the leadership team because you are entering into a partnership with the majority of businesses if you're looking at a so whether you're looking at a work from home business opportunity or whether you're looking at a franchisable business etc you are going into partnership with somebody who what why when where who are the people that you are giving the responsibility to of talking into your life and being part of your future success story and when I say leadership team I mean across the board both internal and external so who's the upline that is recruiting you what is the infrastructure that they provide for you how long have they been doing what they do how true and consistent are they towards that brand have they been stuck with it for a long period of time have they gone through the ups and downs of it are they the kind of people that leave when something gets hard or do they work through the tough spots are they the people that you know that you can lean on to provide you some consistency of the fact that they're going to be around to support your longevity of service and what do they give you back in terms of resources and then when I look at leadership above that in terms of the parent company, how long have they been doing what they're doing? How committed are they to the journey? What is their experience and proven track record? Have they consistently built big businesses? What's happened year on year on year? Are they winners in the circumstances that they have or are they chances, triers, hopers and dreamers? And you'll find a difference between those two things. But understand that if you're going to go into a business partnership with people, that you know who the people are that you're going into a business partnership with, and can you trust them with your life savings? Because that's what entering into a business of this nature is. It's parting with the life savings that you have of time to see a return on said time that rewards you long into the future. Do you trust the people that you're partnered with? This moves to the next point, which is looking at company structure. So the company that you're looking to partner with, what actually are they? Are they a real company? Are you partnering with a subsidiary? What is the actual nature of the corporate infrastructure of the organization that you're partnering with? Do they own the premises that they trade from? What does their balance sheet look like? Do they have some asset and some skin in the game or are they again just a middleman? Are you working with what is deemed to be an international company but is actually just a UK subsidiary of said company which doesn't have any parents or holding back towards the true organisation? These things are key to be able to consider too. Because what you really want to know when partnering with somebody is are they at least as committed as you are to the long-term success of this organisation? 
I've seen far too many people partner with what deems to be a good opportunity on the surface. That when you dig down and you look at the truth of it, that there is no long-term commitment towards the success of the infrastructure behind that company. At any given point, they could pull the plug and it doesn't hurt the parent, the big company that its name has been being traded out on in order to be able to find that success. So you want people with skin on the game. You want people that you know that holds a asset. You want people that know that when times get tough, they're going to stick with you and go through the tough times because every business will have good parts and it will have bad parts. It will be on a purple patch and it will find itself down in the gutter. That is just a journey that happens in every given business. You want people with staying power. And then there's two more things that I would consider when looking at a business and who you choose to partner with. Just two more things. One is the ethics. You know, I mean the values. Are they shared ethics and values? Are you partnered with a company? where at the very top, they believe in the same things that you believe in. Because you've got to get up every day and you've got to go to war for this message. You've got to get up and be the face of this brand on a regular basis. And when you get back down to the core values of what that brand stands for and what the people within that organization stand for, does it ring true to you? Is it something you can wear on your sleeve? Can you kind of look down inside your heart and say, ah, I get it. These people are on the same journey as I'm on. That's something else that I would look at when considering a business opportunity. Not just, can it make me a fast buck, or does it sound like a good idea, does it make sense on paper? Are we on the same page? Does this feel like the kind of company that I could represent? And does it mean that if things were ever to go wrong, that I knew that at least the intent was pure? Something bad might happen, but was the intent the right thing? Were we going to war and going to bat with people who were all on the same page? So ethics and values. And then the final, perhaps the most important thing to you on a personal level, when looking at a business to partner with, when looking at something to work alongside what it is that you're doing right now, where you're looking at somebody where you're going to put some eggs in that basket, is can you stick with it? Can you do the day job part of it? Can you stay with it long enough to be able to enjoy the rewards? Because one thing that will never come true in business is jumping from here to here to here to here to here to here to here, looking for the place that the grass is greener. Because the grass is never greener. You've got to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. Nearly every overnight success story never happened overnight. There was a huge amount of work happening in the background, all the stuff happening underground that you do not see. And what most people look to do is just when they get to the point where something good might happen, they jump ship and go somewhere else and think it's about starting again. That's not the case. So make sure you pick something that you know you can say, I can commit to this for a serious length of time. I've done some analysis on this. And you know how long it takes to get to a position where you are somewhere like an expert or something? It takes about three years of continuous effort before you can get to a position where you get to competent. It will take somewhere like five years of high level activity before you can call yourself an expert. And I don't mean you just let that period of time go by, I mean five years working at something, committing to something over a period of time. 40 hours a week, 48 weeks of the year. So let's call that 50 weeks of the year. 40 hours times 50 times five is 2,000, 2,000 times five. So we're looking at about 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours is what it takes to get to a position of where you can class yourself as an expert or something. So if something hasn't worked for you and you haven't given it 10,000 hours of hard work, chances are you haven't tried hard enough. So don't look for the easy way. Look for the right way and whatever you pick, be prepared to stick with it. Don't look for it just to happen overnight. So choose your business, stick to your business, fly the flag in the way that, to, you know, pin, pin, your, pin your kind of sail to the mast of the organization that you're going to run with and then stick with it. Run through that wall. So that's all I wanted to share with you. Instead of people asking me what to look for and what makes a good business opportunity and what shall I choose over the other one, is look at those 10 different ingredients or nine different ingredients. Is the product a good product? Do people want to buy it? Does the product exist? Is there actually a product? And if there is a product, is it consumable? Is it good value for money in the marketplace? Is there a proven track record that people are prepared to part with cash for that thing and receive value for it and want to come back for more? Is it consumable? What's the genuine risk? How much of your time or money or reputation do you need to put on the line before you're positively going to see a return? 
Is it scalable on an international level? Where is the limit within the sky? What does the competition look like? What does the barrier to entry look like for any of that competition? Can they steal it from you? Are there any patents in place? How much control is there in the supply process? How competent and confident do you feel about the fact that your product is going to sit there forever? What's your exit strategy? There was the fifth one. How can you get out? Is this genuinely willable? Is it saleable? Is there a retirement plan? Can you get out of it? What is your way out of it at some point in the future without losing all the hard work and effort that you've put in? Who are the leadership team, both internally and internally? Do you trust them? Do you respect them? Are they people with a proven track record of success or are they chances, hopers and dreamers? What is the company structure? Is the company committed to the long term? Have they got skin in the game? What is their operational structure in terms of company format? Do you get the feeling from them that they have something to lose in this deal too? Or is all of the risk on you? Are their ethics and values in line with yours? And are you prepared to get up every day and do the day job? The part of it that's going to mean you get to enjoy the successes of the long-term efforts. Because if you're not prepared to be in it for the long term, don't think you can find a short-term success. That's what I thought I'd share with you this Friday night. Nine key things to answer the question of what's the best business to cho choose. And if anybody watching this video right now is not involved in some form of home-based business opportunity, is not doing something alongside the thing that they're doing right now, is anybody considering where to go and how to go about doing things that could generate them some serious part-time income, then do look into this stuff because this is real. It's one of the best available business systems that exists in the modern day marketplace is the opportunity to have something that fits around you, has genuine scalability, and when I look at ticking those boxes, network marketing really ticks more boxes than anything else when it comes to creating serious wealth around your existing commitments if you're prepared to work at it. Have a wonderful weekend, guys. Take care, catch up soon, and um, yeah, keep being brilliant. Good night, guys.